right. All right, good afternoon, everyone, again. My name is Jody Giannikopoulos, and I'm an Adult Services Associate for Addison Public Library. I am here today with Nancy Heath, and she is a master gardener and master naturalist. And I uh, was able to connect with her from University of Illinois Extension Speakers Bureau. I am very appreciative of what they offer and do for me and everybody else. It's a fascinating organization. Definitely check out what they do when you can. Um, just to note, upcoming program for me, Monday night meditation. I do a meditation group every month and this uh, is Monday at 7 p.m. with Daya Sharma and he's amazing. Um, it's a very uh, science-based approach and I welcome you to join us. You can register at addisonlibrary.org. And without further ado, I wish to welcome Nancy. I will let her do the, uh, her own introduction and tell us a little bit about herself and what she does. And then we're going to get into this really terrific program about seasonal garden beds and flower beds. Um, it was a hard choice, Nancy. I had, to, I had to choose something. And this was, I thought, something that would really appeal because it keeps the interest throughout the seasons. Well, Jody, you can have me back every single month because there's always something going on. But this is an excellent, uh, this is an excellent topic for right now. Uh, so let me tell you all a little, little bit about myself. Um, as Jody mentioned, um, I am a master gardener and a master naturalist, master gardening through the, uh, they're both through the University of, Ex of Illinois Extension. Um, in case you don't know anything about the Master Gardening Program, um, it's run um, in every state in the country, um, run through the universities in, that, in the, the, the land grant universities in that state. We have multiple uh, Master Gardening Programs in Illinois, but I'm a part of the DuPage County one. It's a fantastic program. It begins with 10 weeks of training, one day a week. Uh, which sounds like that would be the fun part, but actually the fun part starts after when you start volunteering um, at various things, including including this topic, uh, including a presentation like this. Uh, but if anybody's interested, I encourage you to look into the program. Um, I retired a couple of years ago and I, I basically retired so that I could become a master gardener, <laughs> uh, which was a good, a good decision on my part. Um, so let me get, just, just get right into the presentation um, for today. We're talking about small flower beds with seasonal interest. Um, excellent time of the year to be talking about this kind of thing um, because we, I know I have been spending tons and tons of time out in the garden. Okay, why isn't this advancing here, Jody? Do you, oh, oh okay. Um, all right, so when you're designing for the seasons, we're, we're trying to design a garden that is personally pleasing. And let me talk a little, let me focus a little bit about on that personally pleasing. Um, gardening, just like any other kind of visual or any other kind of art, um, really has a lot of uh, influence in terms of fads, styles, things that are interesting right now, things that everybody's doing. Uh, it's, it's a very trendy uh, hobby, just like I think probably most, most hobbies are. So there's no right way to garden. And so focus here in this, on this slide on the word personally. At the, end of this, at the end of this presentation, I hope you have some ideas about what you personally would like to put in your garden. And you're not going to let anybody tell you if it's the right thing or the wrong thing because you are interested in it for yourself. No right way to do it. Um, today, I want to talk a little bit about bringing some beauty to your garden in all four seasons. Um, frankly, we're going to talk mostly, since we're going to talk mostly about gardening, we're probably going to do a little bit less on the winter um, issue, but I do have some things to say for you about that. Um, we are trying to achieve visual interest throughout all the seasons. Um, since we've just come out of a typical long winter, um, I'm sure you would all agree with me that that's a little bit hard to achieve in Chicago, but we're going to work on it. So how can we make um, your garden um, more interesting? What kinds of things are we looking for? What, what, what kinds of uh, elements of plants can we call upon to help us make our gardens be beautiful 12 months out of the year? Well, some of them are pretty obvious and the most obvious one would be the color of the bloom. Now, right now, um, for those of you, um, you know, if you're on this call, you probably have a garden, but maybe you had one in the past or you just appreciate other gardens. Certainly everybody has seen that there's some wonderful things flowering right now. Um, spring is not a difficult season in the Chicago area. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about more what's blooming. Um, foliage color is another issue though, the leaves. Um, it seems like uh, people are getting more and more into various interesting leaves, chartreuse colored leaves, bluish leaves on hostas. 
um, that that's uh, the, the and the foliage will usually persist through the whole season. So while it might only bloom for a few weeks or a month, the foliage will be there um, at, at least until the winter. Um, plant texture, something I'm going to talk a little bit more about, but we're talking there about the texture of the the, the stems and the branches and the leaves. And uh, there, we're also going to talk about flower size and shape and the plant size and also um, some things that might not be obvious like berries and bark. We're going to talk about each of these things. So let me give you some examples of uh, some, some seasonal interest throughout the various seasons. So here we have spring. This should look pretty familiar to everybody. Um, I'll tell you what these plants are, but you probably know most of them. Starting in the upper left-hand corner, we've got a tulip, uh, a bearded iris to the right, below that pansies, and to the left of that is, um, these are not my pictures, by the way. This presentation was mostly put together by a professional horticultural educator um, who's done a fabulous job. So um, there's a few things I'm going to these places I disagree with her and a few things I'm gonna add, but these are really her pictures. That one on the lower left is one of my favorite fall uh, plants and it's a species tulip. Um, and what we mean by that is a tulip which has not been hybridized. So you can see that they're little, they're not real fancy. They have some sort of basic colors, but they multiply very nicely and they come out very early in the spring. Um, they're little, little tiny bulbs. They kind of look like crocuses, but anyway, that's, that's an example of the kind of thing that you can have going for spring. In the summer here we have on the far left, I think that's a Heliopsis. Um, the, I have the, the names of all the flowers here. The other two, the upper right and the lower right are um, lilies. And in the far left we have Annabelle hydrangea and purple cone flowers. Now these flowers also should seem pretty familiar to you. If you have a garden already, you probably have at least some of these. These are all plants that do extremely well in the Chicago area. Um, and we see them all over the place um, all summer long. Most of these, um, well, the, the lilies and the hydrangea come in all different varieties. Um, this, this um, I have an indication that this one is the Annabelle hydrangea. Um, fall, um, you probably will recognize most of these flowers as well. That's a goldenrod and an aster on the left. At the top, we've got a, a um, Chrysanthemum, and I'm not exactly, let me let me refer to my notes to see what that other one is. Okay, we have porcupine crack, the, the grass is called porcupine grass, and the plant there is Joe Pieweed. Um, my Joe Pieweed gets six feet tall, so I'm not exactly sure. This must be a miniature version, or she's got it planted in an interesting way. Um, and, the, and the plant that's right there near the um, uh, goldenrod is purple dome aster, uh, uh, an aster we're going to talk about a little bit more as well. Uh, most of these also should seem pretty familiar to you because these are all common and do very well in the Chicago area. Um, winter is certainly an interesting time of the year around here. These pictures strike me as very interesting, but she has chosen, um, well, for one thing, there's snow in all of these pictures. And my garden looks so much better with snow on it in the winter. Um, but we are, have not really talked about any of these plants. And in fact, um, one of my concerns um, th throughout this presentation is making sure to emphasize winter interest. Um, it, you know, it's a, it's a small season in some places, but it's certainly not a small season in Chicago. Um, so I think it really is important to think about what you're going to be looking at from inside your house or people passing by your house from both points of view all winter. Um, it's very, very hard in the Chicago area. And um, I, I took these pictures of the Morton Arboretum in early March. Um, I, I, I have the great benefit of living about, I live less than a mile from the Morton Arboretum in Lyle. Um, well, I, and I love the Morton Arboretum. I can't say enough wonderful about it, but these pictures are sort of depressing. I mean, th this is what the Morton Arboretum does for winter interest. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not talking about illumination and things like that. But in other words, I'm just saying, if you struggle with winter interest, so do I, but so does the Morton Arboretum. So let's talk about um, designing a flower bed that has interest for you all season long. Um, and we're gonna start here with thinking about a design goal. Um, most of you probably have something going already, um, even if it's it's uh, containers or part of your yard, but most of you are probably not starting entirely from scratch. But I want to talk today sort of as if we were starting from scratch so that we can all kind of be on the same page and be starting from the same basic sense of, of information. Um, you may have already chosen your design goal. Um, if I was asked to say, what is the design goal for my garden? I'm not sure that any, I'm not sure that my design goals are 
are here on this page um, because I, I am more of a botanist than a designer. Um, and everybody that I know that's gardening is on that continuum somewhere. My husband is much more of a designer than a gardener. Um, but when I get three plants, I like to plant them in three different places to see where they do the best based on the various conditions. And that frequently is not very attractive from a design point of view. Um, but today I wanna talk mostly about design because that's what we're here to talk about. I'm just acknowledging um, that there are some other, um, there's some other ways to think about flowers. And I suppose my, my garden would probably not win a design award. I mean, I'm sure it wouldn't, um, except for the parts that my husband has, has worked on. Um, but it might win a botany award because that's what I'm really interested in is, is, is botany. Um, but, when, 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 but we are going to design a garden today, and we're going to be thinking about things that, um, the, these kinds of issues in terms of visual design, um, you know, what kind of colors does it, does the flower, does the plant have, we already talked about that would be blossoms, but it would also be um, the foliage and the stems and things like that. Um, red twig dogwood has a very, um, a very minor flower that you hardly even notice, but it's all about the big red twigs on the dogwood. Um, and then um, we're talking here about a theme. Do you want a prairie garden, a cottage garden, a hummingbird garden? Um, there again, I would say that my garden is like, yes, I'll take all of those. Um, I greatly admire somebody who can show the restraint and the artistry um, to make a design more cohesive than I normally have achieved. And that's, I'm lecturing myself today because I need to take some of these, um, these points very carefully myself. Um, the, the previous slide talked entirely about visual design, um, and I wanted to point out again that there are some other reasons why you might have a garden and some other things you might want to focus on. I'm really just trying to point out that this is pretty complicated because if you want to have vis uh, beautiful, a, beautifully, uh, a visually beautiful garden, you might also want to have some uh, to address some of these issues. You might be interested in the role of native plants in gardens. That's a whole separate talk, but there are people who have decided they're only planting natives. Um, I have not paid particular attention in the, to in the, in the plant selections we're gonna talk about today on whether they're natives or not. Um, another thing people um, like to focus on is attracting wildlife and the, easy, the most common kind of wildlife to talk about would be birds. Uh, but also butterflies, um, but also some of the less cute things that are very important to make sure that we attract um, the bugs and the, and the um, worms and the nematodes and those kinds of things. Uh, you might plant a garden for improving soil health. One of the best ways to improve your soil health is to get something to grow in the garden. When those, um, when those roots start going down and breaking up the soil and then when the roots die and decompose, there's really nothing better than that for improving soil health. So you may, might want to be thinking about that. Um, I want to mention the concept of serving the ecosystem, and I'll mention one book which is not listed in the references at the end, the book by Doug Tallamy called Bringing Nature Home. Jody, you make it a note of that. You already have that in your library, I'm sure, but you get a couple copies. Um, Doug Tallamy is a professor from the University of Delaware, and he's very, very big on we should all be growing natives in our garden because it serves the ecosystem. Like I said, that's another talk. Jody, invite me back. We'll talk about that. Um, but in the meantime, when you when you start to choose pl uh, new plants, these are things that gardeners are starting to be concerned about. And even on those little tags, those little oh, okay. pictures, they may be able to tell you if you're going to be able to address any of these issues as well. And the last thing I said is to just mix your garden with edibles. To mix, um, and, and I mean edibles in the old-fashioned sense of the word: uh, uh, spinach, lettuce. Um, you know, all sorts of things, tomatoes. I, I do a lot of interspersing um, and it's partly because of crop rotation. I do have one small um, raised bed in which I sometimes grow tomatoes, but you shouldn't, um, you shouldn't do more than one year. You shouldn't do more than one year of anything in those, in anything in any one family. And tomatoes and peppers are in the Solanaceae family, um, and so you don't want to plant those in the same place next year. Um, it has to do with depleting the soil of nutrients, but even more about um, preventing disease, the diseases that these things can get. Um, so I don't usually have a vegetable garden exactly. I put my vegetables in and among my flowers, um, just because it's fun that way. 
Um, okay, but but when we're talking about designing for, for visual interest, one of the first things you want to think about is bloom time. It's kind of obvious, but it's also the most important. And you want to have something blooming from spring through fall. I'm not going to set you the goal of having something blooming in winter, but I will set you the goal of having something interesting in winter. Um, we're not going to get it blooming, but I still want you to have something interesting. Um, so I'm going to talk about some of these other attributes we talked about. We just talked about bloom. Let me, let me go back actually and talk about that a little bit. Um, bloom time could mean it could mean when it starts to bloom, when it stops blooming. When, and one of the things that you um, really want to pay attention to in your garden is how long things bloom. How long is the bloom time? Some plants you just love so much that you don't care that the bloom time is one week or four days. Um, but certainly in general, in terms of designing a cohesive structure, if you can have something that blooms longer than that, um, that will probably help add to your visual continuity. Um, the best way to figure this out is just to plant some different things and see what happens, um, or to do the, you know, the neighborhood walk where you see, oh, look, that's, that's blooming and it's been blooming for a while. Uh, uh, it's it's uh, a very very nice thing to have a perennial that will bloom a long time for you. And I'm going to mention a, a, another book. Um, there's a, uh, this, this author is referenced at the end of this presentation, but she has another book. The author is um, Tracy DiSavato Ost, and she has a book called The Well-Tended Perennial Garden. And it particularly addresses this issue of bloom time because she has over the years developed many, many different ways for pruning and pinching and tying and doing things with the very basic perennials, the ones you already have or you already know about or your neighbor already has. And here's an example. Um, if you take regular garden phlox, the tall one, and um, you cut it, I cut mine yesterday. You cut it when it's about six or seven inches tall. Um, it will bloom later and shorter than than if you don't do that. So based on this author's um, instructions, I go through my garden and I cut down in layers. I cut my flocks down in layers, three different layers, so that it will bloom in different times and that they will bloom at different heights. And it just, just gives you, a, a, to me, in my opinion, my um, a, a prettier looking bloom. So bloom time isn't necessarily something that's absolutely set in stone. If you um, get some good resources and try to figure out some ways to prolong bloom, uh, you can often get perennials to bloom for longer than you might have thought. And the second thing I'll add in there about, about prolonging bloom time is I, for years and years, and this is true of many, many gardeners, I was a perennial snob. It's like, you know, the only thing that counts is perennials. Every perennials, perennials. Everybody's always talking about perennials. You walk right by that annual section, you know, in your, in your Home Depot or wherever, because who does annuals? Well, I'll tell you who does annuals. I do annuals. I do mostly perennials. I mean, I'm mostly interested in plants that are going to stay with me for, you know, at least 10 years or so. But don't under, I used to want to get a bumper sticker that said, don't underestimate the value of a good annual. Um, and it's sort of, I'm, again, I'm sort of lecturing myself because I really avoided annuals for years. I thought it sort of, um, I thought if you're really a good gardener, you don't deal in these tropical plants that are going to die. I don't agree with that anymore at all. Um, I, I, and so also we are not going to talk about annuals in this um, talk, but nothing like throwing in a, fruit, a few petunias in those places in your garden um, where you've got a hole. Um, foliage is also, though, another very interesting thing and not just the, the leaves itself, but um, does it have any kind of dried flowers or seed pods there again a lot of how you uh, a, a lot of whether your plant continues to have these it depends on how you treat your plant at the end of the season. Um, it might have dried flowers or seed pods, but you've cut them off. Um, might have a rose, might have beautiful rose hips um, that you can choose to leave on or cut off. In many of these cases, it doesn't really make any difference to the life of the plant, but it may make a fairly big difference to how interesting that plant looks during the winter. Um, I I leave up pretty much, I, I basically don't do a fall cleaning. I leave pretty much everything up, including annuals. And I had some huge uh, marigolds last year. I mean, huge. One plant would get three by three um, and the flowers were this big. It was a great plant. Um, I left it up all winter because it looked like a bush and those yellow flowers kind of faded and um, stuck on there for a while. And I still, it was still up in March. Um, it would be definitely possible to consider that dead marigold ugly, but I decided to consider it beautiful. It looked really nice with snow on it. Um, and the other main reason for keeping thing, for not doing a big fall cleanup is that um, there are quite a few insects and other kinds of bugs that uh, lay their eggs and 
uh, have part of their life cycle within the dead stems of the of the old flowers. So um, leaving them up serves several purposes for me. And it's another inter another possible way to extend your the, the beauty of your uh, of your garden. Here's just some pictures of, of some things that are not flowers. You can see the lovely uh, berries. You can see the, uh, those are seeds on a, on a lily plant down at the bottom. And um, in the upper right hand corner, we're look, just looking at the peeling bark of a maple. Um, certainly bark on a, on a tree is something that can be very interesting in the winter. Um, this is a point I wanted to make though, before we, we go any further. Um, there is a big difference in your garden in terms of woody versus herbaceous perennials. And the, big, the, the difference really is apparent in the winter. Um, if you don't know what I mean by this, it's simply if your plant sticks around in the winter in any form, then it's a woody perennial or otherwise known as a bush or a tree. Um, just if it stays around for the winter, even in, in any form, it's woody. If it goes away in the winter so that there's nothing there, it's herbaceous. And um, I, I've given you a few examples. The, the, that's a picture of a limelight. That's actually three limelight hydrangeas in my yard. Um, but hydrangeas by Rhea by, by Burnham's, and you're probably, you might say, I don't know these as perennials. I, I would call those shrubs or bushes. It doesn't really matter. There's no real definition. But uh, many of the common uh, perennials, and particularly ones that I like, are herbaceous. I just love peonies. These are peonies in my front yard. Um, <clears throat> I'm not as crazy about hostas, but I have tons of them um, because I have a lot of shade. And as you can attest, these things go completely away in the winter. And so when you, when it's March and you go, oh, I think I'm going to start looking at my garden. I mean, for one thing, you don't really know what you have because there's nothing there. Um, uh, I, I, the garden that we're going to be looking at later in this presentation is almost entirely herbaceous. And this is one of the things that I would change. I would put in a few things with with winter structure, um, a few small, smaller shrubs or skinnier trees or something to give it some visual grounding during the winter. Um, the flower size and shape is very interesting. Um, there's there's an, almost an unlimited amount, as you know, when you walk through any kind of, uh, any kind of garden store. Uh, I have a tendency to like things that are spiky and purple. I have so many spiky purple things in my in my yard, and if it's not purple but it's still spiky, I'll probably get it. I'm not talking about like like swords. I'm talking about soft spiky things. I love soft spiky things. My garden is full of soft spiky things. So one of the main um, things that I do when I'm considering size and shape of a new plant is is it is it purple and spiky? Because don't get it if it is. You already have enough of that. Um, but it's very fun, I think, to look at different things, um, look at how things are structured um, and to think of how they might go together. I have, I have a quick question. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So you're going to your garden center and you're looking at the tags. I cannot remember, does the tag or, you know, the little thing that sticks in the soil that tells you how to plant it, where to plant it, how far apart and all of that, does it tell you how long it blooms? Well, all different companies make those tags and some yeah. do and some don't, but I'll tell you who is never wrong about this is, is Dr. Google. Um, you know, I mean, I do tons of my gardening research on the internet. Uh, it's yes. an excellent resource. And the, the, one of the most excellent resources is all the um, university extension sites, the University of Illinois extension site, um, which I'll give you, I'll be giving you the web, web address at the end, but you know, it's just University of, Exten university of sure. Illinois extension. They have tons of good information, but there's commercial places that have good information. You do want to be a little bit careful about um, looking at the advice from companies that make products like fertilizer, because I don't actually think you need any fertilizer, and they'll be happy to tell you something completely different than that. Um, but I do a lot of my research um, on the internet. So how long is the Black Eyed Susan that you have going to bloom? I don't know, but the internet knows. Okay. Yeah. And you can look up by your zone and when you, yeah. You know, and and you, uh, let, let me just, since you're talking about looking, well, I was talking about looking things up. Let me just make a little comment here about those, those funny Latin names. Um, and I've, at the end of this presentation, I've given you a list of all the plants we're going to talk about with their funny Latin names. Um, <clears throat> when you talk about something like sunflower, there is no accepted definition of what a sunflower is. It's not a botanic term. It means a flower that kind of looks like a sun. Um, that is so many different flowers. 
Um, so if you're just talking to your friend or whatever, and you want to say, hey, bring over some sunflowers, fine. But if you go to a garden store and you say, um, hello, I would like to buy a sunflower, they're going to look at you like you're crazy because it's not a scientific term. Um, they may be able to say, here's our 75 different sunflowers, which one yeah. would you like? But the there's but you know, the Latin names really help you figure out exactly what you're talking about. So there again, if you're requesting a particular plant or you wanna know exactly how that plant works, it's a good idea to try to figure out what the Latin name is. Now, just to throw another, another monkey wrench in, all the Latin names have been changing lately because since they've done all this stuff with DNA, um, they're starting, the, the horticulturists are starting to look at plants and realizing that things that they thought that were related because, oh, this kind of looks like this one, are really not related because when they do the DNA analysis, they're just, you can, you know, you can just figure out that they're not very highly related. So a whole bunch of Latin names are changing as they move things around. So while I'm tr I would like to say, oh, please be scientific about it. Please go find the scientific name. Um, you might try really hard to do that and not really be able to succeed. Or you might come up with two different names. Everybody in the plant world knows that this is going on. And if you go to a, a better garden center and you say, I don't know whether to call this plant, you know, this Latin name or this Latin name, they'll go like, yeah, that's really confusing, isn't it? But they'll know what you're talking about because this is going on. So um, I do encourage you to use the Latin names. I'll use them when I can, because then we know what we're talking about. I don't know how I got off on that whole thing. I guess it was looking things up. Like, absolutely, uh, yeah. It's a, it's absolutely the you know. I totally you, understand what you're saying. Like, just because we have a name for it, does not mean that you can find it by that name. Well, and it, I mean, like, okay, azalea and rhododendron are really the same thing. They're the same family. Some, you know, it just it things that it, it gets very complicated. But but the internet really does help. And if you're having a hard time figuring it out, don't feel too bad about it because everybody's having a hard time, especially in light of all of this new DNA information. And it's making people really rethink things, you know, like, oh, I thought this was related to this, but it's not, it, it, it's, I think it's a very interesting problem, but it is a problem. Um, okay, so what kind of a garden do you want to have? There again, um, I'm kind of starting from an idealized point of view as if you were starting brand new. Probably you've already got some sort of thing going. Um, but you do want to have a general idea of, of you know, wh where you want to go with this. One of the issues that I've had in my garden, for example, is um, I live all right on a corner in Lyle. Um, and everybody, and I live in kind of a backwater neighborhood, and everybody who, need, who, who goes out of this neighborhood needs to go by my yard. So I have thought for a while that my garden was really for the passers-by. And I think that was kind of influenced by, um, I've been working for a couple of years now at the Morton Arboretum where they are clearly about display. Um, but you may want a garden that's a little more personal. And I've been thinking more about the sight lines from inside my house, not so much the sight lines from um, outside on the, on the road going by. So just, you know, what, what kind of a garden do you want? Um, and, and how can you work on making that fit your, your choices? But even more important than what you want is what you've got. And there's a, there's a saying in plant, plant world called right, right plant, right place. What they're really saying is if, if your plant is unsuccessful, you have not fulfilled the right plant, right place thing. You cannot, you cannot decide, uh, it is not a good idea to decide what you want to plant and then try to make it work in your area. It is way more likely to succeed if you do a good analysis of what you've got in terms of sun, in terms of what kind of soil you have, in terms of, you know, maybe the shade is going to come over in the morning from the house, but it's going to be wide open on this side in the afternoon. Um, if you've lived in your house, your, your apartment, even for, you know, a year, you probably have a sense already of, oh, this side of the house gets really hot and this side, the moss grows up the side, nothing ever happens over there. Um, but one of the most important things to evaluate about your site is, um, a little reality check about what we've got going on here in Illinois. Um, we're in hardiness zone 5B. That's a United States term. They don't do zones in other countries. Um, well, they do, but they, they, they steal from the American concepts on this one. Um, we're into zone 5B. Zone 5B only um, refers to one thing. It refer, And you can see that on the lower left uh, on, this, on this slide, although it's a little bit fuzzy. It only refers to how cold it gets in the winter. That's the only thing. Doesn't refer to heat, doesn't refer to elevation, doesn't refer to rainfall, doesn't refer to anything except how cold it gets in the winter, which is a very, very important factor. But that's what it means that we're in 5B. Um, you cannot grow things um, that are supposed to be for zone nine. 
um, <clears throat> you cannot grow things for zone, from zone eight. We get too cold in the winter for those kinds of things. Our uh, soil is clayish and it's moderately alkaline. Um, there really isn't anything you can do about either of those conditions that those conditions were brought to us by the glaciers in the last many millions of years. You can try amending your soil a little bit, um, but basically we've got clay alkaline soil. Um, if you're going to grow in a container, that's a whole different situation. But if you're going to grow on the ground, you're going to be growing in clay alkaline soil. Um, I get really tired of people complaining about that because we have the richest soil in the world. That's why we're the breadbasket to the world. Um, you, you do need to think about what you're planting in that in, in our area, but we can plant more things in our area than practically anybody anywhere. Um, but I do want to do this reality check and make sure that you don't succumb to zone denial because your plants will not succeed if you do. Here's just a, full ex a couple of examples of um, evaluating the conditions. Um, I did not take this picture. I don't know where this is, but I think it is so glorious. Uh, you have there just t so many beautiful perennials. I'm imagining this is probably like about the 4th of July. I mean, this is midsummer. Everything looks great. This has clearly been tended um, and it's just, it's just beautiful. And um, this is just illustrating a much, you know, that, that one didn't look like a home garden. This looks more like a home garden. Um, it's even got a, a statue of some sort in it and a little, little rock in the front. So we've got a little hardscape going on there. Very pretty examples. And this is an example more of a fall situation where you've got some, um, I'm not exactly sure what we've got pictured here in this one. Um, I'll come back to that one and tell you what's pictured in this one. Um, but, oh, here it is. Um, let's see, nope, we, no nope, mixture of sun, mixture of sun situations. This, this garden is in front of the Rock Island Extension Office. Okay, so now we're gonna actually move into the process of, of together designing um, a, a garden that uh, is going to meet a certain set of conditions. Um, here are some pictures of it. We're going to take a look at what we can do ourselves. Um, let me, the first, the first thing we're going to, let me, let me skip ahead to this. We're going to be looking at um, a, we're, we're going to be dealing with a imaginary plot that looks like this, imaginary garden plot, eight feet by 10 feet. Um, this isn't really, frankly, a very great um, design for a garden. It's much too rectangular, but also, um, I would not personally do an eight foot by 10 foot garden without a bunch of pathways through it. This is something that I have learned the hard way. Every single plant that you put in there is gonna need some kind of tending. And if you don't have any paths to get to them, um, to pick the flower, to pull off the dead leaf, to administer the water to the, to the thirsty looking plant, um, it's gonna be really hard. So I would personally put a few paths in here first. Um, uh, and, and if you can't, and for many, many years, we couldn't afford anything other than just putting down wood chips um, for paths, but that, that, does, that does a good job too. So we're gonna start talking about um, bloom time in, in what, as one of the first characteristics um, of a plant. <clears throat> These are just some examples of plants that, and, and when they bloom. Um, you, see, you see here, we've got, um, for the most part, we've got the uh, Latin name. Uh, and I'm going to talk specifically about how we would apply these in the garden setting. But this is just, you know, when you start to think about what do I want to put in my new area of my garden, the very first thing you want to think about is when does it bloom? Um, I could tell you what these things are in their standard name, but um, we'll, we'll, I'll show you. I'll be showing you pictures later, so you'll see. Um, and then when you have chosen a few things for your garden, you need to really think about, um, am I going to be using a color scheme? Um, do I, do I, so do I care? And many of these cultivated uh, plants will come in a whole bunch of different, different colors. And then what does it need? What kind, what does it need in terms of shade, moisture, sun? Um, you need to know these things so that you can make sure that you plant it appropriately in your area. Um, this is what we're pretending we have in our imaginary garden. As I said, it's eight by 10 feet. It's in full sun. It's a border and has well-drained soils. Now these are pretty ideal conditions. You might not have exactly these ideal conditions, um, but these are the ones we're gonna work with. Probably the hardest thing is um, it's kind of hard to get full sun in a lot of places. And plants we're gonna talk about mostly are full sun. Um, so I want to talk now, I want to get into the part of talking about specific plants. So in our, um, the, in our, in our grid that we have here, we're going to put our first plants 
And you can see that they are color coded so that the pinkish colors are things that bloom. We're talking about only about bloom here. We're not talking about any of those other characteristics. We're talking only about bloom. The um, pink ones are for spring, the yellow ones are bloom in summer and the um, green ones bloom in fall. So what are we, what are we proposing to put in here? <clears throat> um, and by the way, there's a list at the end of this which lists all of these plants um, with their Latin names. So I'm going to, ha I have aligned them with a picture here, uh, but they're all listed again at the end. Hey so, Nancy? Yeah. Um, are we able to give a handout to yeah, our- absolutely. Attendees? Exactly. Yeah. So what I like to do is, uh, everybody, just so you know, um, I send it out after the program to everybody who registered. So you and your friend who registered and they couldn't make it, well, you can compare notes because you're both getting the email. Yeah. And so don't, I mean, I should have said that at the beginning. My preference I is, I mean, people are going to do whatever they want to do, but my preference is that you don't sit there taking notes because right. you're going to have all this information. So I'd rather have you listen and be going like, oh my God, that's crazy, or, you know, or whatever. But, but I, I, I realize a lot of people need to take notes. It's what they need to do. So that's wonderful. And I also put the two books uh, in the chat. Oh, okay, good. With Very links good. to the <laughs> publishing house that they're from. Very good. Um, okay, so what are we what um, what what are we proposing for this garden here? Well, the first one we're proposing is false indigo. Uh, I actually have this in yellow. It comes in yellow also. Oh, I forgot to also say this: the color scheme for this garden is going to be pinks and blues and whites. And um, I, as I said, I didn't design this garden. The other person who put a lot of this together was his name is Martha, who I don't know. She's the one who put the garden together, and she did a great job. These are, there are some beautiful plants here. Um, I don't get credit for the choice, but I think she's done a great job. So I'm calling this Martha's garden. Martha has put in um, Baptista, uh, also known as false indigo. And it's kind of in an indigo color here. It does come in yellow and white. I have it in yellow. I kind of like the blue better, but anyway, cool, cool native plant. Um, and then we have the uh, late blooming anemone. I don't have this one. I've got anemones that are blooming now and are just gorgeous. Um, uh, but I don't have this one. And um, Russian sage. Um, now these are all sort of on the tallish side and that's why they've been put um, in the back of this scheme. Let me go back and show you where they are. Okay, so is everybody getting a sense of where those plants are in here? Okay, let's go on. So now we're going to add some more plants and you can see one, two and three are still there, but we're going to add some for four or five and six. And what do you notice here uh, that we have, we still have not now have two that are gonna bloom in spring, two in summer and two in fall. So, you know, when we get, when we get this all done, we'll look back and see, but right now we're, we got a nice balance going. So what, are, what, is, what is Martha proposing for four or five and six? Well, four is a very lovely grass called Overdam. Um, and notice how these are all white. The other ones were all purple. Now we're not just doing this in a line, uh, but think about how great those purples are going to look um, when they are accentuated by these whites. Um, the peony, um, I just chose a white one for this picture. Um, peonies are just about my favorite plant. Um, I probably, I have a very small garden, despite, despite my big talk, I've got a small garden. And I probably have 20 peonies. Um, and a lot of people don't like them because they um, attract ants totally doesn't bother me. They put out a little sweet substance that the ants like. There's no real interaction. It doesn't have to do with the peony's sex life or the ant sex life or anything, but they do attract ants. And so you can either leave them outside or you can really, I'd like to bring them in so I really rinse them off. But because a lot of people don't like the ants, people give me peonies for free, which is partly why I have so many. But I thought that this choice of flowers for the second round, let me go back and show you again where they are. Um, so, so the four is the grass, five is the peony, and six is the, I didn't actually talk about six, that's the um, Artemis Ca uh, Artemisia Palace Castle. Uh, kind of looks like um, Dusty Miller, it's got that beautiful um, um, sort of silvery greenish foliage. So these, uh, the grass and the, and the, and the um, Artemisia here would be examples of, um, they don't really bloom or if they bloom, it's just very minor. Well, every plant blooms, but they don't, it's, you don't, you're not growing them for their bloom. You're growing them for their beautiful foliage and color and arch, the, the way they would arch. And imagine all these things blowing in the wind, you know, lovely, beautiful. Okay, so now we're gonna add um, seven, eight and nine. You can see we're starting to fill this up again. After we add seven, eight, and nine, we've still got uh, a very nice combination of, we've still got, we've got three blooming in the spring, three blooming in the summer, and three blooming in the fall. So what are we gonna suggest for seven, eight, and nine? Going back to purple again, um, 
Seven is an, uh, an aster called Purple Dome. Um, asters do very well and bloom in the fall um, around here. Um, very lovely. Uh, a bearded iris. Um, didn't specify which one, so I chose the purple one. And um, this is Phlox paniculata. Remember, I was I told you about how Tracy D. Sabato Aust does this clipping thing. Um, it looks to me like they might have done it on this one. I'm not sure, but um, this has the nice variegated foliage. I will mention that any plant that has variegated foliage um, struggles a little bit compared to a plant that has non-variegated foliage because it has less chlorophyll in the leaf. So um, I love variegated foliage, but you have, might have to spend a little extra time on it. Um, at any rate, this phlox is one that you could refer to Tracy D. Sabato Aust's book and, um, and trim in a way that would make it last longer and, and bloom at different heights. This looks pretty cool. They may have done this here. Um, <clears throat> Well, I'm on Tracy D. Sabato also. I want to mention one other, my, my two favorite things that she does is the way she cuts flocks. But another thing that she does very well is, um, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold it because we're going to talk about it <clears throat> in these numbers. So we're adding 10, 11, and 12, which is uh, a perennial geranium, a sedum, and um, candy tuft, which is uh, Iberia semperverans. Um, the, the, uh, if you don't already know um, perennial geranium, um, it's a great plant. See, it almost looks like little um, petunias there, but it's not. And it is perennial. I mean, petunias are not perennial. Uh, geraniums in general are not perennial. But this is just a little low bush. Um, it comes in a variety of colors, but they're all sort of magenta like this. Um, very cool plant. <clears throat> very low plant. Notice how as we're getting <clears throat> to the front, <clears throat> excuse me, to the front of the gardener, we're getting smaller plants. The um, geranium only gets you know, six or eight feet tall at most. Um, I want to make that comment, um, that other decent, Tracy Deese about Aust comment, and I wanted to make about sedum because she also has a fabulous idea about trimming sedum, which is that when it gets just uh, about six inches tall, the most common one that people around here grow is Autumn Joy. But if you have Autumn Joy, it's probably up about six inches now. Um, you trim it off now, and um, what you get is... Um, the, the leaves and, and the plant itself stay more or less looking the same, but the flower, instead of looking sort of like a, a head of cauliflower, um, is much more airy and light and just very pretty. And it's just another example of how just by doing well thought through trimming and pinching, um, you can change the way your plant behaves and um, you might just like the way it looks better, but more importantly for me is it often extends the season and that's something you can do on the um, those were the main parts of the garden. Um, you can see here at uh, 12 at uh, 12 and 13, um, 13, 14, 15. Let me see. Yeah, 13. Though the 13s are the stars. I'm, I'm pointing like you can see. I'll point with my cursor. Uh, 13, <clears throat> 14, and 15. Um, 13 is um, <clears throat> any kind of spring blooming bulb that you might want. So let's go back and look at that. You could put some in the, each of those spots, near little empty spots. Um, <clears throat> Hemerocallis, which is daylily. I, I, I picked a bright red one here. Um, probably, oh, you know what? I probably should have picked something bluer or whiter that would fit in. And then um, this perennial grass called uh, the, uh, the uh, fescue called Elijah Blue. Um, and those are possible ones that you could add in. Um, I, I, again, I don't, I would not put personally put bulbs in points, uh, in both of those points at 13. It's a, totally a matter of preference. And, and a lot of my preferences have come from doing things wrong for so many years or just, you know, I, I, there, there's a saying, if you're not killing plants, you're not growing as a gardener. Um, that is so true. But if you're not designing poorly, you're not designing as you're not you're not growing as a designer. And one of the things that I've just recently really committed to about about fall bulbs is that they look better planted in masses. And so I probably wouldn't put these here. Um, there, but if you, but not everybody would agree with me. And if you would like to put a few daffodils in there, that would be great. Um, but again, I'm, I'm not trying to say that a wrong choice was made here. I'm trying to say your, your preference on how you like things to look is all that really matters here. Um, you are allowed to do it the way you want to do it. And so put in some daffodils if you feel like it. Um, I personally love daylilies um, and also grasses. I would probably put those in. Um, this one, we have a few question marks in that in that one spot that's left. Um, you could put a structure there. You could put a bird bath. You could put a little um, a little fountain. You could put a, a and by the way, I have a 
fountains now that run totally on solar, so there doesn't have to be any wiring at all. Um, <clears throat> Or you could put a few additional plants in there. Um, I think I've already made clear to you what I would do. I would probably put a path up through there. I'd probably, I forget what six is, but whatever that is, I might not put that one in. I just, I, I really like paths in a garden. I think it makes um, a lot of difference to winter interest. And um, I also think it makes the garden much more accessible. So in an eight by 10 garden, I mean, this is a pretty big space. I would definitely have some paths in there. Um, one thing she does su suggest if you wanted to put in some additional plants there, um, Martha's Garden can, uh, has Penicetum, uh, Penstemon Husker Red and uh, Scabiosa Butterfly Blue. This, if, you, um, if you don't already have Penstemon Husker Red, you should, and this is a bad picture because uh, the foliage is beautiful. The flower's fine, but you can, I mean, it's a little bit hard to see there, but the, the stems are basically red and the foliage is green and um, it's very glossy and it's already up and it lasts until Thanksgiving. Cool plant, like it a lot. Um, I only have a few more slides here before maybe I bring those, maybe if there's any questions at this point. Jody, we got any questions? All right. I have nothing in the chat, but I definitely welcome anyone who likes to, to unmute. I, yeah, I'm so glad you said that about the path because I was like, where would you put the path? Yeah, I would do the path first. I mean, and this is, yes. this, I was not born knowing this. I know this because of all the mistakes I've made, but I have made um, many massive gardens and just, you know, and just, there's no way in and you have to get in, you have to get in to enjoy it and you have to get in to tend it. So yes, I would put paths. We, we can't tell because it's a theoretical garden. It's not a real garden. We don't know if it's up against a house or if there's a path on one side. But okay. to me, eight by 10 is just too big to um, ha have as a big massive garden. It's, it's just too big. You, you need some way in there. Um, you know, I'm talking mostly about maintenance, but also psychologically. I mean, I like to go into my gardens. I like, you know, to see what's going on. I like my dogs to be able to get into my gardens, believe it or not. Nancy, I, my name is Marianne. I have a Hi, question. Hi. Yeah. Hi. Um, this is about peonies. I have peonies and I love them also. They, how do you, when's the best time to divide those? And do you really have to, I mean, mine have been on, they're on the south side of my house. They're right next to the house. I've lived in the house for 46 years. So they've been in there and I did not plant them. So they've, I've never divided them. They still bloom. What's the, but if uh, I, I have to heard. Divide, I've heard you don't need to divide them for 50 years. So um, oh, I'm, I'm getting to this. <laughs> but you're getting close. <laughs> so when I heard I didn't need to divide them for 50 years, I just said off of my off of my docket. You know, I don't yeah. plan to be here in 50 years. I'm not dividing them. Uh, and I would say, you know, if it, if it ain't broke, don't break it. I mean, it, if it's if they're blooming and they're still doing great, I just think I'd move, I'd leave them. You, I, I have transplanted a lot of uh, uh, peonies lately because of people giving them to me for free. And it takes several years for them to, you know, get reestablished and all of that. So it sounds like if you are dying for more peonies or if you want to give me some, um, <laughs> you probably could, um, but I just don't think I'd bother. I mean, is that fitting what you're, what you're seeing? Um, yeah, I mean, there's still... You know what, they're, they're sort of, how do I describe this? It's like they're spreading outward and then sort of in the middle, they don't, it's not as- Oh, that's common. That's common to leave an empty space in the middle and it usually kind of means it's time to divide. So you're hitting, since you don't know when they were planted, they could well be 50 years old. And, yeah, and you right. know, if, if you have a bunch, I would definitely, this is where I'm a botanist and more, more of a botanist than a designer. I'd take some out and I'd divide them and I'd see what happens. Um, um, not, not really sure how that works in a design perspective, but the botanist in me wants to go, yeah, let's dig some of those up. Let's divide them. Let's replant them in some places and see what happens. What's the best time to divide them? Boy, since I've never divided them, I'm not sure. Um, okay. most I'll look, I'll look on the internet. In the spring, it's probably not too late. Well, no, my, my peonies are probably 18 inches tall by now. Are yours or Oh, I mean, yeah. 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 So probably not now. I mean, and then there's just the purely selfish thing of wait till they bloom. Um, oh, actually, think, mine are probably two feet high and they have buds on them already. Yeah, mine have buds too. Nobody's quite blooming yet, but they're looking really good. Um, you know. Yeah. Which, yeah. Well, they're right next to the house and they face south. And they're, so they, yeah. they're really protected. And it was a great, 
when it was a great winter for horticulture it wasn't super super cold and right. until the end of february when we also got snow which is the perfect thing to accompany the cold weather right that's that's a blanket i mean i don't think i lost anything this year um it was just a great winter for gardening um and it's all you know what and i'm gonna admit it was a great year for gardening because I was home the whole year and I watered the whole year you know and I, yeah. you know, it was a, I, I'm sure I'm not telling you anything weird when I when I said tell you it was a weird year and one of the things <laughs> that I did is I gardened better because I didn't have anything else to do so uh, um, even my master gardening activities were curtailed so let me uh, enter, interesting point Marianne if you would follow up uh, with Jody and maybe let me know if you decide to divide them and what happens and what color okay. are they by the way I want to see uh, how much red the really dark red and i have uh i think one or two whites yeah. i've got about five or six plants only. cool cool i try dividing them really okay okay let me thank um, you uh sir thanks for the question um i wanted to just show the, these uh these are my pictures this is this is my yard um it, it i've been claiming you know that, that we're working very hard on having four seasons of interest uh, but it's hard to do. And I showed the picture of the Martin Arboretum where um, once again, don't let me, don't let me um, say anything negative about the Martin Arboretum because I absolutely love them. Um, but winter interest is hard in Chicago. Um, however, this grass is North Wind Switchgrass. It was uh, recommended to me by a horticulturist. I did not choose it myself and it is fabulous. Um, it is in my yard, which you can't see in that upper left-hand picture. This is actually from last year because the grass is not quite this, well, these pictures are all from last year because the grass is not quite this tall yet. Um, there is a silver sort of railing behind that grass, which is very ugly. And the grass does a beautiful job of covering that up. That's in the spring on the left. In the middle, you see it in the summer. It's just beautiful and swaying in the wind. This gets six or eight feet tall. Um, so you're not seeing it at its full height at all in that picture on the left. Um, on the right, you can see it in the fall. Look at all those subtle colors. It just, it, it, it blooms in that little subtle flower. I just think it's beautiful. And then um, in the last picture, you see there it is with snow on it. So um, this is one of, I think, a, a totally successful plant for four winter interest. Um, a lot of grasses, will will do all of these wonderful things although a lot of grasses are also invasive and i'm you know if you've done much garden you've probably planted a few grasses that you thought were just beautiful until they took over your whole garden so you have to be careful um some are invasive and some are not this one is not so um and but i said it's six feet tall if you don't have the right place at your house it's gonna look funny um but um just i just thought i'd, I'd sort of end the pictures with this this lovely little success story um, this is the list of plants that we talked about with the same numbers. Again, this is um, all done by um, Martha. Uh, she chose all of these. And um, I, I mean, I sort of want to go out and just plant this garden because I think that this is a great selection of flowers. I think that focus on the pink and purple and blue would really work. Nice, nice garden. Um, these are some of the references that we talked about. Um, I actually talked about a different book by Tracy D. Sabato Oz. Jody, if you want to notice, um, this is a cool book. I know this book, but I was talking about, it's called The Well-Tended Perennial Garden. Pro I think those are her only two books, so you should probably have both of those. Um, this is just a little, little uh, uh, information about the uh, extension program at Un University of Illinois. Um, like I said, I was totally impressed with the Master Gardener program and would encourage anybody to look into it either to become a Master Gardener or to contact because you'd like somebody to speak or, or do some other service for your group. Um, this is Martha who created the garden that I've been so admiring. And this is me with my um, pruning tool um, ready to go. Uh, and that is all I have for you today. Um, but I would, I'm not doing anything. It's still COVID. Uh, can I answer any questions? Uh, Nancy, I brought home uh, peonies from my mom's yard and I put them in pots and it worked. Is that really true? You can, can put a pot of peony? Yeah, you can put almost anything in a pot if it's big That's enough. And um, yeah. like, are, are they... Um, Okay, so you did that last year, Jody, or you did it this year? No, I did it in spring. Okay, so there's a, it's a, you know, long story, but I've been to my mom's a few times. She has an amazing yard and everything is perennial. And it was like the snow when I was there the first time of my series, it was nothing and snow. And then the second time they were small. And the last time they were 
you better dig it up now if you want to take it because it's not going to be the right time to do it again yeah yeah uh, so i went to town and i dug up like four different things and um my my 90 year old aunt stood in the garden with me and told me she's like okay these are going to bloom in late june and these are going to bloom pretty soon so i took the ones that bloom in late june June to give them a fighting chance yeah sounds and I great. was so shocked at how root they are and how woody they are mm-hmm. uh, when you pull yes. them out and I well, was and that is well, why I, my, I was totally gambling and it, they are one of the longest lived plants that they're well I mean not not they're not as long lived as an oak tree but um uh, you know within the perennial world they are considered one of the very longest living plants so I don't know what they do to be so long lived they're, they're not native you know they're from somewhere I, somewhere in Asia I'm not sure I would think so too but I have wonderful luck with them too. They just keep coming back year after year. And and I have also started putting some, some perennials in pots. You know, the traditional thing is to put annuals in pots, but there's no reason you can't put perennials in pots. I'm curious what you're going to do with them though in the fall, Jody. Are you going to leave them in pots and hope that they bloom again in the pots next year? Or, or are you going to put them in the soil? Yeah. And I don't, I'm not telling you what to do because I don't know. No, well, I got home and I was like, I got to put these in the dirt and I got to put them in now, uh, like today or tomorrow. And otherwise I feel, I would feel so bad of losing these plants. So, um, I am planning on picking a spot, but mm-hmm. I will be doing some internet research because well, my yard gets every kind of everything I have. Peonies are know, not, peonies are not super picky though. They'll take some shade. They'll yeah. take some clay. Right. Um, they're not super picky. Um, it used to be that people would suggest amending your planting hole with all sorts of good stuff. And that is no longer recommended Great. on the grounds that um, plants have difficulty moving from one kind of soil to another kind of soil, especially if, it, if we're moving from really good soil, like the potting soil it was maybe grown in, to the, to the Illinois dirt. Uh, they don't like to do that. So they'll the roots will circle within the whole of the good soil. They're like, oh, I've got good soil. I'm not going to go into the bad soil. I don't mean bad, but I mean, you know, more difficult, more clayish and a little bit more difficult. The latest thinking is that you put them immediately into the, lo- the native soil. You don't, you don't amend with potting soil or anything like that. So that it immediately has to start putting its roots out and growing into where it's going to, into its forever home. Um, so just a little a little technique the current the current thought is not to amend um, when you're planting a perennial not to amend the soil okay that's great because here in my mind i'm like okay dig a huge hole take entire contents of pot and put entire contents in ground and i'm like i don't know about that no in fact try to get most of the soil off now did you say this were planted at your mom's house and they, yes, and for years and years and years they had been but there. But see, what I was saying before about your mom's house, regardless of where it is, assuming it's in Illinois. It's in Iowa. Uh, okay, same thing. <laughs> yeah. Same, same, uh, same glaciers we had. Right. So your mom's soil is remarkably like your soil and maybe just plopping it right in the dirt would be fine. It's better That's than awesome. if it were in potting soil or something like that. Oh but my gosh, so- I'm so glad I asked. <laughs> And besides, remember what I said, you're not, if you're not killing plants, you're not growing as a gardener. It's, it's okay to kill some plants. Now they're not the cheapest thing in the whole world, but they're not, you know, it, as my husband always says, it's keeping you off the streets. You know, it's better, it's better than some other horrible habits you might develop. So, um, um, but it's not cheap either. It's not cheap. It's truly not cheap. And I think, I mean, vegetable gardening is an example of, can, can you, could, can you save money by growing your own vegetables? Boy, I had never have. I mean, I like, oh, I especially like growing corn. Um, but, you know, you water, you, I mean, the seeds are usually cheap, but everything else, you know, can really take some time. Gardening is not a cheap hobby. It's not. <laughs> all true. All true. Okay. Any other- gonna, I, we could talk all day, but I'm going to open this up. Okay. We're going to do okay. last call for questions. Uh, Nancy, I cannot wait to pick another topic. Great. We'll be talking to Jody. Yes. I think we'll have you back maybe, what do you think, in fall? You know, uh, that would be fall. I, I mean, for about, like one, a fall. one of my favorite things to talk about, uh, talking about saving money is starting seeds, um, which, you know, it's too late. It's, well, it's basically too late now to start seeds. You should have started your seeds in January or February, but that, that would be a fun thing to talk about too. Okay, that was great. Oh, last thing I wanted to ask you is, to, how do you feel about plant apps? The, the, the thing on your phone, you take the picture. Oh, yeah. Um, do, do you mean for plant identification, Joe? Yes. They, 
I'm astonished. They work great. They don't okay. always work. Um, but I use the one usually called Seek, although you don't even need to do that anymore. There's now a thing called Google Lens. You guys all know about Google Lens. Oh, yeah, you can't. But anyway, there are multiple ways now to use your phone to identify a plant. And they basically work. Um, where they don't work, well, the one, I use Seek mostly from iNaturalist. And it, the, first, the first division it wants to make is to tell you whether your plant's a monocot or a dicot. Now we haven't, we've talked for a whole hour about gardening and I haven't even mentioned the words monocot and dicot. So you probably think like, what? Just trust me that they're two different kinds of plants. Most plants are dicots, but some things like grasses and corn are monocots. And um, sometimes that is as close as the will get you. But most of the time, not only does it give you a name, it's usually right. So it's way beyond me how that artificial intelligence is working, but I use those all, I use those apps all the time. Oh, good. Oh, great. Okay. They're very good. Okay. Oh, um, and they're free. I, at least Seek is free. Got you. Yes. Yes. Um, okay. So Nancy, I see that you have an email address down there um, in the yes. slides that I'm going to send uh, off to our participants and our registered folks. Great. Is that in there as well? Can people email you with questions? Absolutely. I pretend I have a t-shirt on that says, I'm a master gardener. Ask me. That's right. You're just gold. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jody. It was totally enjoyable. Thank you, everybody. And don't hesitate 100%. to get me, get in touch and let's talk gardening. Oh, 100% enjoyable. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, everyone, for attending. Thanks, Looking everybody. Looking forward bye -bye. to the next time. Bye-bye. Email me any questions. I'm going to send out the handout as soon as I get it. Great. Bye, everybody.